So today we are continuing in, uh, in our series on the Holy Spirit, and we are going to be looking at uh, the Holy Spirit's role in conversion. Um, conversion, if that is a foreign word to you, uh, to, to, to some, uh, conversion is, in, in my opinion, um, one of the most accurate ways of describing uh, the change that occurs uh, when someone becomes a Christian. Um, see, a, a Christian isn't just someone who, um, who, who believes in God. Um, a Christian isn't someone who uh, just, you know, says, you know, I, I, this, you know I, I believe this. Rather, a Christian is someone who has been converted or transformed. Um, in John 3.3, 3, um, the Bible describes Christians as those who have experienced a new birth, meaning that uh, they have died to their old life and are born again as a new person uh, with a new way of living and a new way of believing. They have been converted, transformed, replaced, resurrected. Not simple believism, but transformation. And today, my hope is that we will understand not only what conversion is, but the role of the Holy Spirit in Christian conversion. And, and I pray that we, that, that we would see just how reliant we are on Him for true conversion, and that this will move us to not only pray more, but to evangelize in a healthy way with greater freedom and joy, because there is a difference between evangelizing in a healthy way and evangelizing in an unhealthy way, and we'll get into that a little later. And so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, we are going to be in John 16 for the most part. Um, all the other passages will be up there, so um, if you have your Bibles, just uh, open them up to uh, John 16, and that's where we are going to be uh, for uh, the most part. Um, and the first thing I want to direct our attention to is verse 7 of our uh, text where uh, Jesus says it is to our advantage uh, that he departs so that the Holy Spirit can come. That it is for our good that he departs and that the Spirit comes. And um, I, I, I don't know about you, but if, if, I'm, um, if I had a choice, um, I, I would rather that Jesus be physically present. Like I, and maybe I just lack faith, you know, maybe I'm just a visual person, uh, but I, you know, like Jesus says it is to our benefit that the spirit comes and the heat departs, but, but, but I, when I read this, I, I just think otherwise, right? And, and I think that there may be some of you guys who may be in the same boat as me. When you initially read this, you, 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 you would say, you know, you know, Jesus, I would, I would much rather you be here so I can see you do crazy miracles. I can see you raise people from the dead. I, I can hear you audibly speak to me. I, I think, God, that that would be better for me. Okay, thanks. Like, I, I think that it would actually be beneficial for my faith if you were here instead of you leaving and you um, giving me a spirit that I cannot see. And I, I wonder how many of you guys would, how many of you guys feel the same as, as, as me? Like when you read this, that this is your a gut reaction. And, and for those of you who feel this way, I, I want to say I, I get it, but Jesus, um, but, but Jesus says differently. And the question is why? Jesus says it's better for him to depart and for the Spirit to come because he understands the limitations of sight. I want, to, I want to quickly take you through two stories from the Bible that outline the reality of uh, this limitation. The first uh, story is the story of Jesus and Lazarus. Um, and that is found in John chapter 11, uh, starting in verse 1, going all the way to John chapter 12, uh, verse 11. I wish we had an hour and a half for me to preach. If, if that was the case, we would read this bad boy and we would break it down. But we don't have time, so I'm going to give you the Coles Note version. Essentially, Jesus' friend dies. Jesus raises him from the dead. Um, and, and, and there's your story. And, and, you have these, and you have many, many people witness this and they're, and they're just like this guy's God 
and, and they give their lives to him and they start following him. But then there are others who see this and who say, we've got to kill this guy. And not only do we've got to kill Jesus, we've got to kill the guy who resurrected because he's raising too many people from the dead and because he's convincing too many people of um, of, of, of just who he is. And, and, it's, and, and it's crazy for me. Like, I don't understand that. Like, if I saw Jesus raise someone from the dead, I would just be like, I think this guy's legit. But there were others who actually saw that. And you guys see in the verse over there, um, yeah, and, and, and you see in the passage that, 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 that there, there were those who who witnessed the miracle and then who decided that um, what was going to happen was they were going to kill Jesus because he was too influential and they would had to kill Lazarus as well. It just blows my mind that this happens. And um, I, w- I want to take you to our second story, um, which is um, actually Jesus' own uh, death and resurrection. Um, and uh, for that, we are going to uh, go into Matthew. And I just want to quickly outline for you that Jesus uh, was uh, murdered on a cross and he rose from the dead on the third day. And many people saw and heard and believed. But others continued to not believe. Right, and the Apostle Matthew even records that some people bribed the guards that were guarding Jesus' tomb to lie and to say, you know, you know just, just tell people that his disciples stole the body that you were asleep, and, you know, we'll take care of it. And back then, and, and back then, just as a point of reference, uh, this, it, it was a big deal if guards fell asleep. Like, they would have been executed um, if they admitted to this, but they uh, openly admitted to it, and the, uh, religious leaders, um, and the religious leaders protected them. And, and again, this just blows my mind, because... You would think that if you saw this, that there would be no room for doubt. That there would be no room for you thinking that he doesn't, that, that he isn't God. There wouldn't be room for that. And these guys saw with their eyes the resurrected Lord. And yet they didn't believe. It sounds crazy. But the prophet Isaiah actually spoke about these people. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, he said, Go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the hearts of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. When Jesus was on this earth, he performed countless miracles taught with unprecedented authority. And people called him crazy and a liar, and a criminal. And they crucified him. Human nature may say that seeing is believing, that human history would show us that seeing is not nearly enough. That there must be more. Contrary to what we may feel, sight does not produce faith. Right? Sight does not empower us to obey God and to give our lives over to Him. And while we're on the topic, neither does human wisdom or intellect. Uh, Reverend Ted preached on this passage two weeks ago, but in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, 5, uh, the Apostle Paul points out that human wisdom alone cannot um, sway anyone towards Jesus Christ. That's why Paul did not come with human wisdom. That's why Paul did not come with philosophies. Because he knew that even if he did come with the most, um, the, the, the most wise uh, rhetoric, it would not sway people to believe. And, and, and if it could, then all you really would need is rhetoric. All you really would need um, is a wise person. For those of you who are thinkers, and, art, and, and fancy words for those of you who are artsy and feelers. And that's all you would need. 
words on a page, or words that are proclaimed, or words that were sung beautifully and formed beautifully. And you would see the words, you know, man of sorrow, lamb of God, by his own betrayed. And then you would say, yes. Yes, that, 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 that's, that's right. Conversion. Life transformation. That's not the case. We have more songs at our disposal now, more information at our fingertips now than ever before. We, as a generation, are more blessed than any other generation prior to us in terms of literature, in terms of the, in terms of the arts, in terms of wisdom. And yet that has not propelled us to a greater level of obedience and belief. In fact, I think we're seeing a greater gap between what we know and how we act. Which further solidifies the fact that we cannot be persuaded into believing in and obeying God by a simple transference of knowledge or by simply seeing. It is not enough. And I know I took a long detour from our text, but I want you to see that the Bible is very clear about the shortcomings of sight and reason. And the problem, and the reason why they don't work is because they are natural solutions to a supernatural problem. See, our problem isn't that we don't know enough to believe. Our problem is that we have been infected by a supernatural blindness and hardening caused by our sin. Therefore, what we need more than physical evidence and human reason is the Holy Spirit who heals our hearts in order to create faith. What we need more than reason and sight is the Holy Spirit who heals our hearts in order to create faith. Let me take you to two passages in the Old Testament. In Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after this time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Ezekiel 20, uh, 36, 27, And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. These are two Passages that point to the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. And he takes the word of God. And brings it into our hearts. Changes us. He is the supernatural spiritual solution to the supernatural, spiritual problem of sin. See, Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead in order to pay the penalty for our sin and in order to break the power of canceled sin. Then he ascended into heaven, that's what we get in our passage, so that he can send us his Holy Spirit And the Spirit works in us with the power of Christ in order to create obedience and faith by convicting the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. That is our our chapter, verse 8. Saving faith is not a product of sight, but a product of the Spirit. That's why in verse 7, Jesus said it was better that he departs, that it is to our advantage that he departs, so that he can send us his spirit. And in verse 8, the world world is referring to Um, non-believers. And so so what we see here is the Holy Spirit convicts the world, he convicts non-believers concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That is his role in conversion, that he convicts and convinces no, 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 no. I, I want to be clear. 
and point out that the Spirit also convicts believers of our sin and of uh, Christ's righteousness and of impending judgment. But the result is not conversion. The result is sanctification. That Christians are already converted. And so the Spirit, and so when the Spirit convicts us of our sin and convicts us um, of the fact that our only hope is in Jesus Christ, He produces in us a greater a sense of worship to Jesus, a greater sense of, um, of, 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 of affection for Him, reliance on Him, needing uh, for Him. And as the Spirit increases our conviction, we will be moved to draw nearer to God in faithful obedience. When the Spirit convicts the believer, we are drawn to greater obedience and greater worship and a deeper love. For non-believers, the Spirit's convicting work produces conversion. Now, I want to clearly define the word convict for us. Merriam-Webster defines conviction as a strong belief or opinion. And so even with a secular definition, I really hope you guys see just how finicky conviction is. Right? That conviction is not, there's no formula for conviction. And... Like the, the the best example that I can think of is um, almost everyone knows that 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 eating healthy and that exercising are keys to a healthy lifestyle, right? I mean, the, the, these are these are facts. Now, when some people hear these facts, they are convicted, right? You know, they start eating their veggies and they start, you know, they hit the gym or they go for a run. You know, some people are convicted; they're changed, and it's excellent. But some people would hear this, shrug, and keep eating those chicken nuggets. And, and, and it's just bizarre for me how that happens. Because for me, you know, I, I think these facts are so clear. Right? They're so clear. You, you eat healthy, you exercise, and not only will your quality of life increase, but for, for most people, you, you just live longer. So it doesn't make any sense to me why anyone would hear this, would see these facts and not be convicted. I mean, it just blows my mind. But I, but I think it just proves that facts alone, no matter how many facts are thrown at you, facts alone do not convict, do not change, do not transform, do not convince. Conviction cannot be taught with simple knowledge transfer. There has to be something more that affects someone to change their beliefs and opinions. And when the Bible is speaking of conviction, um, it is not speaking of dieting or exercising. It is speaking of God and of, and of our sin. The Spirit convicts us and causes us to have a strong belief about Jesus Christ by convincing us that He is real and that He is amazing. That is the work of the Spirit. When the Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts, it is saying that He convinces us and affects us and transforms us and changes us so that we will know and believe that Jesus is God and that we are sinners. Let me just simply prove this. Uh, let, 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 let me simply show you how this works. Um, in our passage, uh, you will see that um, the Holy Spirit convinces us of our sin, convinces us of Christ's righteousness, and convinces us of Satan's impending judgment. So this is how this works. I, I, I will try to be as simple as I can possibly be. Um, we had a time of confession and repentance uh, just 15 minutes ago. And in that time, all of you guys were hopefully doing the same thing. Right? You were doing what 
um, what, uh, what, 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 what Ivana said earlier on or what I said um, a, a few minutes ago, which was to read Psalm 51, to confess and repent of your sin, and then to reread Psalm 51, or at least hear Psalm 51 as we prayed it together. Now, here's what happened. My assumption is that we all did it. All right? I, that's, 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 the working, that's the working assumption that I'm going to go with. If you didn't do it, then, you know, your loss. But when that happened, there were one of two categories of people. One, you read the psalm. You were struck at the heart of your, uh, by, by your sin. You saw your filth. You saw how offensive and hurtful your sin was to God. You confessed with a broken and contrite heart, and you repented. And when you reread Psalm 51, or when you heard Psalm 51, the love of God rushed into your soul, jumped out of the pages, and struck you in the heart. Either that happened, or you read the psalm, you're just like, okay, I guess I'm supposed to pray. I guess I'm supposed to confess. So you confess, so you go through the motions of confession. Again, there is no, um, a, a, no, no, no conviction, no, um, no a realization that you are, in fact, sinful, in, in fact, dirty. And then when we reread the psalm, you read the words, you know, God is a gracious and loving God compassionate God, quick to forgive, and you read these words and they are uh, more fiction and story than fact and reality. Now, we all did the same thing. But why were the results so different? It is not because some of you guys are smarter than others. It is not because some of you guys are more um, apt to read poetry than others. It is not because some of you guys are more in touch with your feelings than others. It is because the Holy Spirit has convicted some and has not convicted others. See, what he does is he not only tells us or tells non-believers that Jesus is God or that they're sinners or that Jesus is the only way to be made right with God. The Spirit not only tells them of these things, but he convinces them, convicts them, affects them. And he convinces them that this is true. And that's the work that the Spirit does in non-believers, and that's the work that he has done in every uh, born-again Christian. See, all of us at one point in time did not believe in Jesus. You, you, you might have gone to church your whole life and heard the gospel many times, but Jesus and the Bible, they were more stories and fables than they were fact and reality. And then one day something just clicked. <laughs> I, I can't, I, I, I wish I had the vocabulary to be able to explain it better, but one day something clicked. And all of a sudden you believed this. Right? The Bible wasn't just a book, it was God's written word. Jesus wasn't just some guy who said some things, but he was the God of the universe who loves you and who died for your sins. And you know that.
And I want to tell you that on that day, you didn't all of a sudden become smarter. You didn't all of a sudden just, you know, get in touch with your inner child. Rather, what happened was on that day, the sovereign, almighty God changed you, convicted you, converted you. That's what happened. You became convinced that heaven is real, that hell is real, that Jesus is real. There was internal transformation that caused you to hold on to the Bible as true, and as a result, you responded by repenting of your sins and giving your life to Jesus. Please remember this, that human persuasion and reason and sight in and of themselves are inadequate in causing conversion because they are natural attempts at solving a supernatural problem. It just doesn't work. That's why we can come up with the most sound, logical arguments for God. And they can be met with blank, unbelieving stares. Truth claims do not transform people. God transforms people. Now having said that, you know, having said all of that, what is our role as an evangelist? Right? If God is the one who convicts, who converts, who convinces, then, then, then what's our role? And, and I would like to say that our role is to be faithful in presenting the gospel. Right? We are to clearly present the gospel in as persuasive and as logical a manner as we can do it through every means available to us. That means we are to testify uh, to God's love with our words and our actions. We are to lovingly invite others into gospel reality by loving them sacrificially and then by pointing them to the greatest act of sacrificial love and that is Jesus dying on the cross. And we are to be faithful and persistent in our witness. That means that we are not only doing this once. We are not only sharing the gospel once, or we're not only being sacrificially loving once, but persistently and consistently. And that's our role. And I need to be clear with you, the Holy Spirit will not do that role for us. Right? He won't write in the sky, Jesus is Lord, and he won't spirit hug anybody. Right? That's our job. Right? Our job is to, uh, he has called the church to proclaim the gospel and to, and, and, to, um, and to be incarnational with the gospel and to love people and to show people with our bodies and our lives the love of Christ. That's our job. And, and some of you guys would say, what, 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 what's the point Right? What's the point of learning apologetics or, or demonstrating love to others or, or doing evangelism training if, if none of this is effective for conversion? What's, what, what's the point? Well, there, there are two things. One, you love Jesus. And you love the lost. And this is your act of faithfulness to both of them, to both parties. It's your act of faithfulness to Jesus because you love him and you, want to, and you want to tell others about him. It's your act of faithfulness to others, especially those who don't know Christ, because you know that the best thing you can possibly give somebody is to tell them about God. So that's your act of faithfulness to them, your act of love uh, to them. Secondly, you know that as you do your role faithfully, the Holy Spirit will do his. And the Spirit will take our reason. He will take our loving service. He will take our testimony. He will take our teaching. He will take our proclamation. And He will make it effective. See, without the Spirit, our work accomplishes absolutely zero towards drawing anyone to God. Without Him, we are helping no one know God. With Him, our work becomes 100% effective. Right? So without Him, 
absolutely useless, absolutely pitiful, with him, 100% effective, 100% useful for conversion. 100% useful for, um, for, for, for drawing people near to God. He takes our natural activity and infuses it with his supernatural being. He indwells our work and makes it useful. The Holy Spirit makes our effective uh, it makes our witness effective. And, and I want it to be very clear. He doesn't add to our work. Right? It's not like we do 20% of the work, you know, we do, you, and he does 80%. That's not how it works. The Holy Spirit takes our powerless, 0% effective work and gives them the ability to convince and to convict, and ultimately to convert. He takes our work and makes it effective. And not only does he do that, but if you look at verses 12 and 13, you will see that the Spirit reminds and, convince and convicts us of our mission to pursue non-believers. Now, this may not seem abundantly clear, so I, uh, running out of time, quickly want to draw you to two things. The first is that the Spirit is not saying anything new. That's in verse 13 but is repeating Jesus' words. And secondly, the Spirit is going to say what Jesus has not yet told the disciples, what they cannot bear to hear. Now, we need to keep in mind that Jesus was saying, um, say, saying this on the last night he had with his disciples, and so um, there was only one other occasion after this where he taught the disciples, and that's after his resurrection, before his ascension. And in Acts 1, 1 to 3, Luke records that Jesus spent those 40 days with his disciples speaking about the kingdom of God. And so what Jesus had not yet told his disciples was, um, the king, well, it was about the kingdom of God and their role in bringing the kingdom of God from heaven to earth. And so when the Spirit is speaking to us, one of the things that he says is, um, is he tells us our role in bringing the kingdom of God from here, uh, from, from heaven to earth. And what our role is in bringing uh, the reign and rule of Jesus Christ uh, through our engagement in evangeliz and evangelizing the world. And so to put it together, uh, to, 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 to put this all together for us, I know I'm doing a lot of reading, but this is uh, really technical and I don't want to uh, mess up. Um, the work of evangelism uh, in the work of evangelism, our role, your role, the church's role, um, is to faithfully and to persistently engage non-believers with the gospel. And the Holy Spirit's role is to compel us to do this work and to make our work effective. But the Spirit not only reminds us and compels us to evangelize, but He takes our powerless, ineffective, labor and he makes it effective now that's our role that's his role now i want to quickly throw up a table and show you guys uh what it looks like for us to engage in healthy evangelism and for us to engage in unhealthy evangelism so healthy evangelism um, evangelism, uh, healthy evangelism, uh, those, uh, and uh, as, as we do this, um, how I would like you to, um, to, to, to receive this is to, is for you to, one, identify where you're at, and two, uh, for you to understand why, um, why, why you should evangelize in a healthy manner, why this matters, why the last 30 minutes mattered. Right. I, I struggled with this because this is so dense theologically. And it's just like, why go through this with you? And the, and the answer that I got is, because if you do not know this, you will fail as an evangelist eventually. Let me show you why. Healthy evangelism is both duty and worship. An unhealthy evangelist, uh, evangelism is duty alone. 
What that means is, um, as we have been going through uh, John 16, my hope and prayer is that you would see the limitations that we have in the work of evangelism, the supremacy of God in evangelism, his sovereignty, his grace, his might, his power, And that the act of evangelism would be not only a demonstration of that, but a recognition of that. That the act of evangelism would be in and of itself worship. Because you are magnifying God's power, you are magnifying God's strength, you are magnifying God's sovereignty, you are magnifying God's might, you are magnifying uh, His sufficiency, and you are minimizing your Self. That church is worship. And my hope and prayer is that you would see that evangelism in and of itself is an act of worship, is an act of offering to God, is an act of magnifying God. And it is not duty alone. Because if it is worship, since it is worship, for those who evangelize as worship, you will not only exalt God as sovereign, but He will come down and you will experience Him as sovereign and as powerful and as majestic through your evangelism. And if it is duty alone, then there will be no such experience no such empowering by the way there's a third category um, uh, non-evangelists uh, for for you non evangelism is a suggestion not a commandment uh, that's wrong um, so the second thing is so, so so my hope for you again is that through this that you would recognize that evangelism is a uh, worship secondly uh, that evangelism in evangelism you are depending on the might of God and that that would drive you to pray. Right, and this is just an instant, uh, this is just like, if you are not sure what kind of evangelism you do, all you need to do is check to see whether or not you are praying for your non-believing friends and family, whether you are praying as you're evangelizing, whether you're praying after you have shared the gospel, because you understand the limitations of your words, the limitations of your loving acts. Healthy evangelists, healthy evangelism is fueled by prayer. Unhealthy evangelists, we depend on our might, on our wisdom, on our ability to impact change through our loving service. And therefore, prayer is one of the things that we do and not the central activity for evangelism. Again, there is a difference because unhealthy evangelists will still pray, but it is one of the things that they do instead of the central main thing, main activity, main exercise. All of those things are fueled by prayer. Non-evangelists, why pray when I can play? Third, um, the responsibility, and this is actually really important, pastorally, uh, from, from, for, from me to you, uh, the responsibility is to proclaim the gospel and to love others with all of our might. Unhealthy evangelists, you have those responsibilities and you have the responsibility to convert. And that is an enormous pressure. And I don't know how you guys live with it if you guys live like that. If I lived, if I was an unhealthy evangelist, I would kill myself after every Sunday, after every Sunday sermon, actually. Because looking out there, there are days where it's depressing. And I love you. Like, I love you. I would die for you. I would gladly die for you. And I, w and I will spend every day that I have um, working for um, this church until God calls me home. Right? I, I've made that abundantly clear to everyone who would listen to me. And I love you with all of my heart. 
but there are some days where it's depressing. Not, and, and sometimes it's not because of you, sometimes it's, it's because of me, because like, you know, I write, I, I write these sermons, and, and right before I go up, I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> like, this really sucks. And then I preach it, and I go down, and I'm like, that sucked. Oh, sorry, now you know my inner monologue. Um, I, I, and, 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 and nothing you say will convince me otherwise, because that's just my own inner monologue. Um, by the way, and so please, you know, I, I like don't you, you you don't. This is not a cry for you to flood after me after the service and be like, "That was amazing! <laughs> that was awesome! Holy Spirit conversion conviction! Awesome!" All right, that, that's that's not what I'm looking for. Um, I I am simply trying to point you to the reality that my job, my role, is to be as faithful as I can in expositing and explaining this word and in speaking what God wants to say to you, regardless of whether I think this stinks or not, regardless of whether you um, fall on your knees um, with tears and, in conver- and with uh, conviction and conversion, or whether you stare at me stone-faced like some of you guys are now. My responsibility is not to get you to go from stone face to happy face. My responsibility is to preach the gospel to you. It is not my job to convict or convince. It is God's. And for you as an evangelist, that is your role. Please do not tack on the burden of conversion or else you will want to shoot yourself in the face. Um, Third, uh, fourth, pressure is to be faithful not to convert. Pressure is to be faithful and to convert. That's kind of a reiteration. Uh, Fifth, evangelism produces humility and promotes self-glorification. I know I am flat out of time. All I will simply say is if you share the gospel as a healthy evangelist, you will realize just how limited you are as an evangelist, how limited you are as a person. You will cry over a person. You will beg a person to receive God. You will study night and day. And you can be met with the same blank stares time and time again, regardless of your effort. And then there are other times where you just say, you're a sinner. And then the other person just breaks down in tears and cries and says, I know, I know. You know tell me how to fix this. And then you share the gospel with them and they give their life to God. And it's crazy. I've been, I've been, I've experienced both. And in both cases, there is just an incredible humility that just flushes over me because I know that I did nothing in either case. One was evident that I did absolutely nothing, and one was equally evident that I did absolutely nothing, that it was, that, that it was the power and presence of God that convicts and converts. My hope for you, um, as, you um, as you are girded um, theologically, as you, are, as you um, are strengthened with this word, is that you will become healthy evangelists, that you would increase in your worship of God and, um, and increase in the recognition of his sovereignty and might. That you would um, become healthy evangelists, that you would pray, that you would pray, that we would pray. Yeah, that's, that's what I hope for us. You know, that we would receive this word and become men and women who evangelize in a healthy manner, meaning that we would make prayer a foreground primary activity.